Shalom, and welcome to Light of the Hill Ministries. And in today's teaching, we, we, we will be talking about Purim. If you want to follow along, I will be posting this in the comment box below. And now, under the teaching. And all the king's servants who were in the king's gate bowed and did obeisance to Haman. For so the king had commanded concerning him. But Mordecai would not bow or do obeisance. Esther 3 verse 2. Mordecai was a Hebrew living in the Persian capital of Shushan during the reign of Akashrush. He was he is probably most well known for being the cousin of Queen Esther and for the, the important role he played in the government. The name Mordecai can come from either the Hebrew or the Persian language. The Hebrew, in Hebrew, the name is made up of two parts, mar, which means bitter, and dark, which means oppressed or crushed. When placed together, Mordecai means bitter, oppression, or crushing. While well, some sources say it means servant of Murdoch, a Persian deity, there is no evidence of this actually being the case. It is most likely of Hebrew origin and means bitter oppression, as mentioned above. It is fitting since Mordecai was a deed captive who was oppressed by Haman, and he sought to crush the Hebrew people at the time. Mordecai, the son of Yair, belonged to the tribe of Benjamite, or as they are commonly called, Benjamin. It was related to Kish, King Shaul. In the citadel of Shushan, there was a certain man, a Yehudi, whose name was Mordecai, son of Jair, son of Shemi, son of Kish, a Benjamite. Esther, too, were spied. But then they asked for a king, and Elohim gave them Shaul, the son of Kish, a man of the tribe of Benjamin for forty years, Acts 13, verse 21. Mordecai is mentioned several times in Esther, chapters 2 through 5, as sitting faithfully at the king's gate. After Haman was removed from power, Mordecai was promoted to prime minister. Mordecai's first act as prime minister was to nullify Haman's recent law to annihilate the Hebrews throughout Persia. So the king's scribes were called out at the time. In the third new moon, which is the new moon of Shavuot, on the 23rd day, and it was written according to all that Mordecai commanded to the Yehudi and to the viceroys and the governors and the princes of the provinces of from India to Kush, 127 provinces, to every province in its own writing, to every people in their own language, and to the Yehudim in their own writing and their own language. And he wrote in the name of the, of the king Ahasuerus and sealed it with the king's signet ring and sent letters by runners on horseback riding on royal horses bred from speedy mares, Esther 8, verses 9 through 10. Mordecai didn't allow circumstances or self-preservation to dictate his values. His refusal to bow to Haman reflected his belief that Yahweh alone should be worshipped. Mordecai continued to bow to Yahweh alone, even though Haman grew increasingly angry with his actions. Mordecai had faith that Yahweh would save his people no matter how bad things looked. He encouraged Esther to be Yahweh's instrument and go before the king to seek the welfare of the people. Do we likewise show the same selfless love and concern for the brothers and sisters? Do we possess the same faith to place Yahweh as the ruler of our hearts, no matter what others say of us? 
Or do we find ourselves growing complacent and perhaps puffed up when Yahweh blesses us with stability and success in our physical and spiritual lives? We would do well to heed the writer of Hebrews who tells us, in order that you do not become sluggish, but imitate those who through belief and patience inherit the promises. Hebrews 6 verse 12 We should imitate those who have faith in Yahweh, such as Mordecai, who show selfless love towards the brethren and not become sluggish about it, but rather show concern through prayer, entering into the throne of favor on their behalf. Therefore, let us come boldly to the throne of favor in order to receive compassion and find favor for timely help. Hebrews 4, verse 16 This is where we get compassion for the brethren. That is through Yahweh himself. As, after Esther was orphaned, Mordecai showed compassion towards Esther by taking her into his own household and treating her like his own daughter. And it came to be that he was raising Hadassah, that is Esther, his uncle's daughter, for she had neither father nor mother. The young woman was beautiful and of good appearance. And when her father and her mother died, Mordecai took her as her own as his own daughter. Esther two verse seven. He also showed compassion for the Hebrews living in Persia by working tirelessly to save them and himself from Haman's plan to exterminate them. Yahweh he is compassionate. He is sympathetic to the suffering of his people. He sees our distress and takes pity on us. However, his compassion is more than mere sympathy or pity. Yahweh's compassion is related to his kindness, patience, favor, forgiveness, and love. In fact, some of these attributes are so related and interwoven as to make clear demarcations between them difficult. Yahweh's compassion compels him to take action. He is no impotent observer, but the omnipotent king ruler of the universe. What, shall, what then shall we say? Is there unrighteousness with Elohim? Let it not be. For he says to Moshe, I shall find a favor whom I have favor, and I shall have compassion on whomever I have compassion. Romans 9, verses 14 through 15. Yahweh showed Mordecai that he did indeed have compassion for his people. So too can Yahweh show us that he does indeed have compassion for his people, if we allow him to show us and enter into his throne of favor. Mordecai, and, Mordecai, and like Mordecai, we should think of our sphere of influence during Purim, who needs our compassion, who needs our prayers, who needs us to be sympathetic and empathetic towards them. Are you a father or mother, child, teacher? Where can you make a difference for those around you or for the less fortunate? Is Yahweh calling you to step out in faith to relieve the suffering, or to help someone on their journey towards Yahweh. He may have placed you in your current position for such a time as this, to bring others a glimpse of Yahweh's love and compassion. We celebrate Purim by showing compassion to those who can't. We give them the love they need during this season. And we celebrate the victories Yahweh gave us against the Hamans of the world. Purim is an opportune time for believers in Messiah Yahushua to offer praise and thanksgiving to the one who watches over Israel and does not slumber or sleep. He who does not allow your foot to be moved, he who watches over you, does not slumber. 
Psalms 121, verse 3. The first thing to do during this time is to read the book of Esther for yourself. My wife and I do this every year as a reminder of the event of good over evil. The second thing we do is try to give to those who have less than we do. Whether it's our time, prayer, or something we value. The last thing we do, as in the book of Esther, is have a time of feasting. Therefore, the Yehudim of the villages who dwelt in the unwalled towns were making the fourteenth day of the new moon of Adar a good day of gladness and feasting, and for sending portions to one another. Esther 9, verse 19. So we feast as a memorial of this day in honor of Yahweh's deliverance of his people during this time. Purim also affirms that while oppressors come and go, Yahweh's promises, Yahweh's promise and covenant is with us. Yahweh's promise and covenant with us is everlasting. Happy Purim. Hallelujah. If you like this teaching, please comment, like, share, subscribe, and click on the notification button to be notified of the next teaching. Yahweh bless and shalom to your homes.